Technology was both a blessing and a curse during the pandemic. It let many carry on work and social interaction via screens, but it also blurred the lines between those as never before. To writer David Sachs, the experience underscored what he suspected even before COVID. It's all in his latest book, The Future is Analog, How to Create a More Human World, and David Sachs joins us now for more. Welcome back. Good to be here, It's great Steve. to have you here. Yeah. You know, if we did this interview a year ago, I'd be talking to you on a screen. You know that, right? It would have been a lesser experience. No kidding. No kidding, for sure. Okay, let's share an excerpt from the book, and then we shall chat. The future, you write, is analog because we are analog. This is what the pandemic taught me. Human beings are not digital. We are not pieces of hardware driven by software. Our destiny is not preordained on some exponential curve. We cannot upload our minds to the cloud and transcend this world. We are flesh and blood creatures bound by biology and all its quirks, and we experience life in all its richness, risk, beauty, and misery. When we try to replace that reality with a digital facsimile, we are lost. So says David Sachs. Let's start with this. Define analog. Analog is a imperfect term. Uh, kind of sweeping, but I would say it's the opposite of digital, right? Digital is everything that requires computers to work. Um, it's the language of computers, binary code, ones and zeros. And analog is everything beyond that, the physical, tactile, human, face-to-face, -face, real world. Kind of like what we're doing right now. Exactly. The analog version of this versus what we would have done a year or two ago, the remote version of that, the digital version. Now, you're using digital technology and the cameras and the editing software and the broadcasting of streaming it and putting it on YouTube, um, but this conversation here is analog. Uh, so it's, I say it's an imperfect term because it's never exact in its definition. Um, there's many engineers who've taken umbrage at this in the way I've used it, but I think it's become a pretty common shortcut for not digital over the past decade. You weighed in on this topic with your previous book, Revenge is Analog. What made you think you had more to say about it? <laughs> well, that book looked at a sort of emerging and somewhat limited phenomenon, right? I was looking at why we were seeing the growth once again of things like independent bookstores, vinyl records, film cameras, um, paper notebooks, uh, all these objects and spaces that had been sort of predicted to die off, like the dodo bird. And they didn't. And they didn't. They actually were growing again, and people couldn't understand why. And so I was, that book really looked at what was happening in those individual areas, but also what sort of linked it together. This book is much broader because the experience we had over the past couple of years of digital living forced upon us by the pandemic for good reason, right? For the reasons of health and safety mm -hmm. and the security of you know, our society and the world. Um, uh, it, it gave us a much deeper, broader, and more immersive view of what the digital future was gonna actually look like. And also where in our lives analog had its value. You know, we never would have considered the value of something like a cocktail party in an analog setting until we experience the hell of the Zoom cocktail party. <laughs> Having said that, this notion uh, clearly was kicking around in your head well before COVID happened, right? Yeah, I, I was getting questions when I was giving talks or um, doing interviews, media interviews. Uh, and, and often there would be this sort of um, uh, statement at the beginning. Well, it's like, well, we know the future is digital. So, and I was like, whoa, hold on. What do you mean you know the future is digital? What does that statement mean? Well, the world, we're living in a virtual, we're living in a digital world, people will say. It's like, what do you mean? The, we, I have a phone, we use computers, but like the world is analog. You know, I, I'm still, I'm still flesh and blood here. And I think in our culture, um, in the media, in the world of business, and I think just in the sort of popular discourse that all of that's fed into, the narrative of Silicon Valley and that assumption that the world is digital and the future is digital and that digital is an inevitability. I see Kevin Kelly's book over there, The Inevitable. I mean, that is, that's the argument of that book, right? That all these technologies sort of coming to define and dominate our lives are inevitable. There is no sort of going toward it. That, that really seeped into our collective consciousness. Um, and so I was already being asked about this as the guy who's the sort of flag bearer of analog. Well, what do you think about this? What do you think about the future? You know, we know the future is digital. I'm saying, well, hold on. You know, the future of all music was gonna be entirely digital. And in many ways it has. We have Spotify and Apple Music and the limited streaming, but the 
biggest and most profitable, fastest growing part of the music business is physical sales of pressed pieces of plastic, right? And going to concerts. People and going to concerts. More than yeah. ever now, yeah. You know, everything was gonna be digital and book publishing because we had the Kindle and we had the Nook mm. and we had the Kobo and nine out of 10 books are still sold in paper. And stores like Indigo and independent bookstores like Type here in Toronto and Analog Books in, in Lethbridge, Alberta, um, they're growing and expanding and their sales are doing well. So nothing's inevitable, right? Well, but here's where I come in and say, yes, Yeah. but, <laughs> There's something deeply ironic about the fact that you write a book called The Future is Analog. And did you do any interviews in person for this book? No, you didn't. They no. were all done digitally, right? Yeah. All done on screens. Screens or phones, yep. How unsatisfying was that? Uh, it, was, it was functional. It was effective. I didn't spend a cent on doing research and flying anywhere mm -hmm. for this book. Um, and I got the information I needed, but it wasn't satisfying. You know, I got into journalism to see the world and have adventures. And mm. I've done that. I lived in South America as a freelance correspondent. I worked as a travel writer. Um, uh, I've been all over the world writing stories. And for the previous books I've done, I've traveled all over. I mean, for Revenge of Analog, I went to an abandoned film factory in the Italian countryside for three days and, and toured through these massive buildings that were gonna be demolished. I've ridden on the back of ATVs through cattle pastures when I've been writing about ranchers. I mean, I've had conversations and adventures in the context of the real world and all of that filled those pages with not just the words that people said, but the stories and the environment that surrounded them. Mm. And this was just Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call, which was quick and efficient and worked, but it was draining. I would do two in a row and I was exhausted. Three and I was, I was a wreck, I was done. Have you thought about how the book might be different had you actually been able to go into the field and do all these interviews face to face? Yeah, in some way, I mean, I, I, it, it would have been very different um, if the government had allowed our borders to be open, I guess, mm. and, and I had had the wherewithal to sort of go out into the world. Um, but this was written in the heat of the pandemic. And so it is very much a time capsule of that period and what life was like. And I think the unease and the unsatisfying nature of that, the, the feeling of being trapped at home and only doing things on a screen, is kind of essential to what the narrative is, right? In many ways, it's it's a memoir of not just my pandemic experience, but the experience of many of us who were sitting at home with their children, you know, jumping around in the background trying to do virtual school while you're ordering groceries online and and trying to watch something uh, and and trying to do a bunch of Zoom calls while you're juggling that with your partner, or your spouse, or in your mother-in-law in your in case, in my mother-in-law's you know cottage. <laughs> Um, uh, that was my reality, but it's also the reality of many, many people out there. And so that, that is, for better or worse, what the book is about. Let, let's do, I, I, the, the example in your book I love the most, and I'm gonna set it up this way. I remember many years ago having a discussion with a newspaper reporter who said, who boasted, you know what? I can get a piece in the paper without ever leaving the office. You know, I can do it all by just calling people and no one can tell the difference whether I've left the office or not. David's Deli. Okay, tell the story about the guy where you found out that nugget of information, mm. which you never would have found out had you just done it on a screen. Yeah, this is a story from my first book, which was called yeah. Save the Deli. But you out. refer to it in here. Yeah, it came out in 2009. So this is 2007. You know, the way I did research for this book, which was about the, the demise of the Jewish delicatessen kind of as an institution all over the world. Um, I basically got in my car here in Toronto and I drove from Toronto to Los Angeles, to Miami and back over a two month period. And I stopped at every deli I could find along the way, right? So I'm in San Francisco a month into this journey, many sandwiches and calories later. And I'm, I'm at David's Deli, which was near Union Square, it no longer exists. And David Applebaum, the owner came out to talk to me. He was an older gentleman in his eighties. Um, and I was perusing the menu while I was waiting for him to come out. And the menu was this incredible thing. I mean, these are restaurants with a lot of personality and it had, each item was a description and a story and jokes. I mean, each one had a little paragraph. This menu was like 20 pages. And one of them was like, you know, David's chopped liver. It's chopped what, a thousand, you know, 563 times. No, why is this number? It could be arbitrary. No one knows. Maybe David says it's his lucky number. And I said, you know, oh, it's great to talk to you. And I was interviewing him and I said, you know, I had this question. I was looking at the menu, you know, what's this joke? 
and he rolls up his sleeve and shows me the number that's the exact number that had been tattooed on his arm by the Nazis at Auschwitz. And you know, a little smile creaks up on his old face. And it was just, stop me in my tracks. And that's just one tiny piece of information that I found out because I went there. Now, I could have phoned David. We could have had a conversation. I would have gotten the history of the deli and the story of his life and whatever, but I wouldn't have gotten that. I wouldn't have seen his reaction and be able to describe it. I wouldn't have then be able to go into a deeper conversation with him, reading his body language. And these are all the things that in the real world, the analog world, we're able to do. They're the things that we missed when we were at home and we only had digital screens and devices and interactions, right? The reason why the Zoom cocktail party is the most awful, insipid <laughs> thing ever. I, I do a thing in my talks now with the book talks. I say, I'm going to say three words to you. Zoom cocktail party. And everyone's like, Ugh. I said, if I paid you $25, who would attend one for an hour? I'm like, one hand, the cheapskate goes up. Fifty dollars. Oh, like four hands go up. All right, a hundred dollars. You know, then like every hand slowly Gotta goes up. And I was like, I'll, I'll do it for a hundred dollars. Be like, oh, okay, 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 I'll do that. Right, but it's the the bar is so low and the experience is so flat. Right, it's like the screen. It's flat. It's textureless. And this is what I talk about when I say we have human needs and we are analog creatures. Is that we can do all sorts of things. Online, We can live our entire lives, work, go to school, shop, entertain ourselves, pray, exercise, without ever leaving our house, through the internet, through different devices. This is the future that Mark Zuckerberg is promising us, the future of human connection. We're going to strap the screen onto our eyes, and then, you know, it'll be a Steve Paikin hologram, <laughs> but you'll be a bear, or whatever the heck he's selling, right? And what are we missing? We're missing all the texture and richness and interactions that make the world what it is, that make human life what it is, that, that are our reference points for reality. And reality is still where the action is. Do you want to use the words you actually use in the book to describe how you feel about this? <laughs> nah, maybe it better not. We're on at uh, 8 o'clock at night. It is anyway, a public access channel. It is, uh, yeah, there was plenty of, prof of uh, profanity in this book, I must say. Way more than in your previous books, I think. It was anyway. an angry time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, it really captured the zeitgeist. It came through. That. It came through. A lot of F-bombs in there. In your chapter on cities, you write, true innovation in a city can just as easily be analog, and it often is. Now, that goes against the grain of everything we're being told these days. Why do you say this? Well, I, I thought about cities because this was right around the time that, that the Sidewalk <laughs> Toronto thing was, was kind of at the peak of its debate. This is the Google company that the wanted Google to build something on the waterfront. Downstairs in the uh, downtown on the waterfront. Um, and, and we had been told, you know, the future of Toronto is innovation. It's going to be a digital city. Um, and this is the way we're going to do it. And, uh, and what did we actually see? And, and I know there's been wonderful books that you've, you've had wonderful guests on who've talked about that. Shoshana Sachs, who I interviewed in this, was a guest recently. Um, uh, you know, in, in a city like this and in other cities across Ontario and Canada and the world, you know, what were the biggest innovations we saw? It wasn't QR codes at restaurants. It wasn't, you know, those contact tracing apps that never worked and the government paid, I don't know, how much? 50 plus million something, bucks for them, some, yeah. Some, some not insignificant yeah. amount of money. It wasn't drones or, 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 or any of these wonderful promised things. What, what changed our life in, in, in a city like Toronto? It was when the pandemic hit and the city's like, oh gosh, all these people are stuck inside, what are we gonna do? Uh, I guess we could close Lakeshore down on the weekends <laughs> and people can bike and ride um, until of course they decided no, no, we can't, can't do even that. do that. The tra the Jays. How are people going to get to the Jays game? Um, it was the thing that people had been begging for and lobbying for for decades. Why can't we have patios in the city? Like when I go to Italy or Brazil or any other civilized place, and you can just put a sidewalk out, and they're like, I guess we could use these parking spots. And it's transformed the city. It's transformed a place like Young and Eglinton here. Yep. It's transformed down by Osington where I live. It's transformed small towns like Collingwood um, and, and, and everywhere. It's all of a sudden brought life out. None of that required any new technology, but it was innovative, right? Mm -hmm. Putting bike lanes in a city is far more innovative and impactful than any experiments in self-driving cars that we've seen. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've surrendered the narrative. We've surrendered the word innovative to digital. Innovation, we think, has to be a gadget. It has to be an invention. 
but it's not. And if you think about it in the world of food, this is my favorite analogy, right? Technological innovation in baking was Wonder Bread. Mr. Chala guy here. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Chala guy, <laughs> right? Pre-packaged, pre-sliced, preserved, infinite, you know, fortified with nutrition Wonder Bread. And then someone came along 50 years ago and they're like, hey, what about sourdough? Let's bake sourdough again. And people are like, oh yeah, this is, this is actually the best thing since sliced bread, a baguette, right? That's, that can be innovative too. And so innovation is not this one-way street of just inventing the next best, greatest technology. It's sometimes taking old ideas and repurposing them like pedestrian areas mm. or bike lanes or restaurant patios or a baguette. Did the challah turn out well, incidentally? Yes, I, I got pretty good at baking. You did, okay. Yeah, but then I yeah. went back to Harvard Bakery as soon as I could <laughs> um, because they just do a better job. They do a better job, they do. Yeah. If you are pro-analog, does that mean you are anti-progress? <laughs> that, that, you know, that the, the Luddite brush mm. is this sort of knee-jerk criticism that you're against progress, you're against innovation if, you're, if you believe in these things. I, I, I completely reject that, right? What I'm arguing for is critical thinking around the future and around digital technology. Because there's, there's two certainties for this future, for any future that we're going into. One is that digital technology is gonna to continue to evolve and grow. There'll be new innovations in hardware and software and artificial intelligence and robotics and whatever else is coming down the pipes. And, and that's gonna present new opportunities and new challenges. But the other truth is that we remain human. We are analog creatures. And as long as we are these flesh and blood creatures walking on this earth and in this city and in this province, our human needs are still gonna be central. So how do we build that? What goes into an analog future? Well, when it, it, it gets back to that question of critical thinking. It's, it's, it's looking at a technology and examining it and saying, is this going to make my life better? Does this, does this elevate my experience as a human, right? Does this make it more productive or more meaningful to work? Does this help me or my children learn? Does this connect me more to other people or does it drive a wedge between us? And so that critical thinking is the thing that, that led Toronto and the waterfront to say, all right, you know what, the sidewalk labs thing? Not for us. Not for us, mm -hmm. right? If, if you could find me one person in this province who's gonna say, you know what, the future of Ontario schooling is online education. Like, I will buy the tar, I will buy the feathers, and I will drive them out of town. That's an ironic Personally. point for you to be making at this place, because, of course, we've been doing digital education here. We're a huge partner of the Ontario government. I say yeah. that in the interest of full disclosure, but, you know. But it's not, you're not saying we're going to replace schools. Correct. Right? You're, we're going to create the videos, we're going to create the things, but the, the core of that thing is still the school. And Correct. I think if you're going to find anyone that argues against that, and they're going to say, no, 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 this is progress, I don't think anybody, having gone through the experience of the past couple of years, will pull, take up that argument. Agreed. Right. This was a book that needed to be written, and I'm really glad that you wrote it, because it's a point that surely needs to be made. So Thanks, thank you. Steve. The future is analog, so says David Sachs. If you don't believe it, read his book, How to Create a More Human World. David, as always, thanks for coming in. A pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.